Coming up on DTNS, did your Chrome extension spy on you? Huawei says that OS was never meant for what you thought it was anyway. And Patrick Norton tells us why it's a good time to build a video game machine. This is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, July 19th, 2019. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And from L.A. County, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And, of course, Patrick Norton, host of AV Excel and This Week in Computer Hardware, back with us. Patrick, thank you for joining us. I, and I could only wish my video could join you, too. <laughs> well, the people on audio don't even notice. They always imagine you in your most beautiful form anyway. <laughs> just imagine that patrick is being very very still uh hey, folks if you're not getting good day internet you've missed a uh, great conversation about one night in bangkok uh and a bunch of other stuff become a member and get the show at patreon.com slash dtns let's start with a few tech things you should know Twitter would like to offer users more context about unavailable tweets. So tweets can be unavailable for several reasons. They could contain a keyword that you've muted, or an account's tweets could be private, or a tweet got deleted since being posted, et cetera. Twitter says that the new feature should give you more information about why that tweet went dark and become available in the next few weeks. Uh, some tweets are emotionally unavailable. In fact, a lot of them. <laughs> ZDNet reports the Kazakhstan government has been intercepting HTTPS traffic from devices within its borders since July 17th. Local ISPs have been told by the government to have customers install a state-authorized CERT on all devices and browsers that lets them spy on you. In 2015, Kazakhstan ordered citizens to install a similar certificate, but dropped those plans after multiple organizations sued the government. A parrot spokesperson confirmed to The Verge that the French company has left the toy drone market, adding that Parrot has stopped the production and development of any drone, but the Analfi and its variations. In recent years, Parrot has shifted its business towards commercial drone solutions in an attempt to distinguish itself from competitors like DJI in the consumer space. I really wish it was a Parrot spokesperson. Like the spokesperson was a Parrot. Oh, we, we and were then what do they do? They just repeat whatever you say? <laughs> repeat whatever you tell them. <laughs> We're off the market. <laughs> We're off the market. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about that Huawei thing. Let's do it. Huawei SVP Catherine Chen stated that the company's Hongmeng operating system is not being designed as a replacement for Android after all and will focus on industrial uses. Huawei Communications VP Andrew Williamson toward, told Reuters in June that Hongmeng was in fact testing as an Android replacement that could be in place in month following blacklisting. So what's going on here? Yeah, I. It, the, the, it's, it's tempting to want to look at this story and say like, well, of course it was wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You're trying to back off. If you took the trade negotiation bit of this out, uh, yeah. let's say Samsung with Tizen says, oh, we have an operating system. We were thinking, oh, we might use it for phone, but we're not. We're using it for watches and TVs. Uh, that's exactly what happened. And uh, nobody really got bent out of shape about it. Uh, so it's perfectly reasonable to construct a storyline where Huawei has been developing an operating system for Internet of Things and industrial use, which is why you may have heard of it's called an Internet of Things operating system. Uh, and any operating system could conceivably be adapted to any other use. So maybe there was a little thought of like, well, could we take our IoT industrial operating system and make a phone operating system out of it? That's uh, really a lot easier to say than to do. And if you don't need to do it, then you might see a path towards your SVP saying like, oh, no, that's for industrial use. Patrick, what do you think? make of this? Uh, you know, at this point, I, I'm... I... I, the whole Huawei thing is such a train wreck. <laughs> like, yeah, I just, I, I, I have nothing left to offer at this point. You know? <laughs> what, a, what would you uh, install a Hongmeng uh, OS in your industry, or is this wow. going to be a purely Chinese domestic operating system? Well, yeah, he we, says, yeah. knowing the answer. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know, you know, there's an awful lot of domestic market in uh, mainland China, and there's an awful lot of countries that have zero problems with buying from Huawei. So, it doesn't really matter. You know, they'll find some place to put it. Uh, you know, the thing that people forget is, is you know, Android is open source. Anybody can use it. The part that gets banned is all the parts that make Android particularly useful by being integrated into Google. So, 
Yeah, you know, and again, security updates get yeah. to the open source project later. So, you're, well, yeah. I mean, at this point, you know, the, the 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 pace of security updates is not something I found particularly impressive on anything other than flagship phones, mm -hmm. and sometimes not then if you have a you know a, a carrier that takes. You know what I mean? Like when when you know for a fact that something's been fixed, but it's been in your carrier for four and a half months after the fix has been shipped, uh, before it actually shows up for a physical. You know what I mean? They, it, I just that whole. Well, yeah. Now, now add on top of that, Huawei can't put the fix into their own version of the OS to give to the carrier until it gets to the open source project. That that was one of the uh, yeah. one of the hangups there. But it's. I mean, it sucks. Um, but it's you know, I, I feel like that whole ship is sank or that. Train train is passed or that that ship is left that train is passed like you know insert name of strange mid 20th century you know it's kind of over whether it's over or not at this point at least in the u.s all right security researcher sam jadali discovered a browser extension vulnerability for chrome and in more limited cases on firefox called data spy i called it data spee earlier today because it's two eyes at the end but i get what he's tr he's trying to take personally identifiable information and make it part of the data spy thing so we'll call it data spy but it is spelled spii affected extensions collected urls web page titles and sometimes embedded links of every page the browser visited uh the histories were published on a fee-based service, in other words, a service you pay for, called Nacho Analytics. Uh, links often included tokens that allowed access, and if shared, would give anyone with the link access. So it's the kind of link that has the token built into it. You're only supposed to generate that link when you have authenticated, but hey, if you copy the link and give it to someone, uh, they're gonna have it. Of course, you would never do that, but if your extension stole it, you wouldn't know that, right? Uh, <laughs> Nacho Analytics had collected pages that included surveillance videos, even from some Nest cams, uh, tax returns, medical records, whole lot more. Some pages wouldn't load, but the page titles would reveal information. So a lot of corporate pages that were password protected still leaked out the actual name of the page. So Tesla internal product development, uh, some some Apple internal product development, other corporate secrets that you could glean from just the title. The privacy policies of the extensions themselves said that data collection would happen and would be shared with third parties. Nacho Analytics claims that data collection was opt-in and that data is scrubbed of names, locations, and other sensitive data. Although the more Ars Technica and other outlets talked to Nacho Analytics, the more they said, well, we try very hard to scrub <laughs> because it was becoming clear that the scrubbing wasn't catching everything. Uh, Nacho Analytics CEO Mike Roberts told Ars Technica that his company has now stopped new signups until it gets more information on the issue of sensitive data still appearing. Uh, he still claims that you had to hit an agree button to share this stuff anyway, but they, they want to be good citizens and not have the sensitive info now that everyone knows that the sensitive info is there. Uh, Mozilla and Google have removed all of the extensions that were reported by Jadali from their stores. Two Firefox extensions still appear to be available from the developer websites, even though they're not available from Mozilla. And Google has remotely disabled uh, its extensions as of July 8th. Interestingly, five days after July 8th, Robert said on Twitter that Nacho Analytics had an upstream data outage. And uh, we don't know if that's connected in any way or not. But Man. Uh, yeah, a uh, kind of a, a complex situation. But, but if you didn't quite follow that, to sum it up, uh, extensions were logging every URL you visited and giving it to this analytics company, which its main product was to say, if you want to find out statistics about domains, you can pay us for those statistics. So I want to find out what kind of people are visiting my competitor. I could find that out. But as part of that offering, you could also see all the URLs that were collected. And sometimes those URLs, as I said, had sensitive information in them. Yeah. And even if they didn't contain sensitive information such as passwords, just browsing history in general. Well, yeah. I mean, and 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 possibly not associated. They are anonymized. Nacho Analytics says they are anonymized and they were. Uh, but sensitive information in that, you know, it's a link to your tax records uh, that no one would ever have otherwise unless right. it had gotten into this database. It is the way the web works. Now, uh, the, the CEO told Ars Technica, like, we're just, you know, we're using the way the web works. 
uh, it is probably a, a, a wake up call that, you know, a kind of security through obscurity of saying, well, this, this link was generated after authentication and nobody else can get it isn't good enough. Uh, because I don't think Nacho Analytics was being actively malicious. They just turning a blind eye, yeah. hoping that no one would notice. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is information that was uh, helping that company uh, extensively. <laughs> Biocout or chat room says, sorry, you got cut. It's just the way a knife works. <laughs> <laughs> We're a knife. What else are we going to do? Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's, there's a lot to parse on how this happened, but in the end, uh, this is not okay anymore. The old way was we just collect a lot of data. Most people won't notice what's in there and, and we'll, we'll get by, uh, these days that doesn't work. The, the fact that the internet works in a way that reveals personal information is not washing with the public anymore. Yeah. Even anonymized, you know, at, at one point you're like, okay, well they can't trace it back to me, but that doesn't really work either. <laughs> it turns out if you have all the, or all the resources of the internet. <laughs> yeah. You can still kind of, it. yeah. Like point it back to certain people depending on usage. Oh. Well, on a happier note, perhaps Google Stadia director of product, Andre, uh, Andre Dorenchev answered questions in a Reddit AMA on Thursday, comparing Google's commitment to Stadia to that of Gmail, Docs, music, movies, and photos, and said $10 a month subscribers will get roughly one free game per month, give or take. Dronachev also said that the UI will be revealed in November with friend lists, party creation, and platform level voice chat will be ready at launch as well. Achievements, Bluetooth audio for the controller, and family sharing won't arrive on Stadia until after launch, however. Stadia will offer full support for all HID compliant game controllers. So we we've got uh, a little bit more information here. The idea that you're gonna, you know, he's he's bolstering the idea that you'll get at least one game a month uh, for ten dollars a month, which you know games cost sixty dollars. So uh, conveniently, that that would make it worthwhile. Uh, he's also reaffirmed the idea that you go you buy a game, even if Stadia goes away, you'll still own that game from the company. They'll figure out a way to do that. Uh, trying to assuage people's fears that Stadia would would go the way of Google Reader uh, or, or wave. Uh, I, I think he has a good argument that stadia is more of the stature of Gmail and docs, not, not of these, these, he you hopes. know, not Google plus, but, uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, Patrick, what do you what do you make of this whole Google Stadia thing? Uh, I mean, one, I, this this will be the second time I've brought up uh, killedbygoogle.com in a podcast this week or in the last seven days. Um, and two, I'm I'm very curious. Everything we've seen that's that's tried to do this the streaming of games has mostly been disappointing uh, when it hits the real world. Google's going to throw ridiculous resources at it, which may actually solve it. Um, you know, I love the $10 a month uh, subscription fee. Uh, I'm very, very curious to see what the quality of the games are, um, you know, but it's 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 super early and I, I want it to work. I want all of the streaming services to work so I won't be disappointed. Um, but, you know, this is this is just going to take a huge amount of I, I guess the you know, it's it's just it, I'm curious. I'm even more curious now. I love the price. I think that's just what I want to say. Now I really want it to work and I want the games to not suck. Yeah, I'm actually uh, fairly confident it will work. Uh, whether it will work well enough for every gamer, I mean, that's that's a whole different story. There's going to be latency and lag. Uh, it's the amount of latency and lag that maybe only professional gamers will will notice, right? And, that, I would and be not, thrilled Stadia is not trying to say this is for pro gamers. I, yeah, I mean, I would be thrilled because, because you know, I've seen professional gamers where they're like, Meh, and you're like, I can't feel this. And they're like, that's why you get fragged all the time. And I get yeah. that. But I, I just want to see it not be irritating to me. Yeah. Um, and and if you have, a, it, again, it's going to depend on your internet connection. Some people's internet connections will not be good enough for this, even though yeah. they're, they're saying something ridiculous like 25 megabits per second, which seems low to me. Um, but but I think a lot of people will. And uh, then it becomes a matter of whether the policies work or not. And it's kind of the worst of both worlds in a way of saying, hey, uh, you get a monthly subscription price that you keep paying for access to nothing because you still have, I mean, yeah, you'll get a game free, but uh, <laughs> but you have to pay for everything else. But but it is a subscription. You know, and, and I think it was in Gadget or Ars Technica that pointed that out, which is Netflix says, monthly access, but you get everything. Right. Uh, or it's, uh, you know, some kind of situation where you buy things like on Steam and keep them in the cloud, but you don't have a fee. 
Well, you know, and if they could just give you a f- like, if even if it was twenty twenty bucks, twenty five bucks a month, and but it was access to the entire library, I would pay the twenty five bucks over ten bucks over the current system. Yes, for yeah. all the things. Well, and and I think we're going to see some versions of that. Some of them even on Stadia, where it's like, well, you're paying your ten dollars for your Stadia, and then fifteen dollars for complete access to the EA library, let's say, or somebody. <laughs> Uh, whatever. I think I, I don't think we'll see EA do that, but I bet we'll see somebody try that. Microsoft announced in Q4 its revenue grew 12% on the year, marking the ninth straight quarter of double digit growth for the young upstart Microsoft. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, you did finally make it. Good work, kid. Uh, Microsoft's intelligent cloud business, which includes Azure, Windows Server, and GitHub, but mostly Azure, uh, generated $11.39 billion in revenue, although a lot of that does uh, probably come from Office uh, for the enterprise. Azure grew 64% on the year, um, which is good. In fact, this is the first time that the intelligent cloud generated the most business unit revenue at Microsoft. We've been talking about Microsoft becoming a cloud company, but this is the first quarter that it really became predominantly money-making, a cloud company. But that 64% growth is slower than last year. Uh, and a lot, it has a lot of people starting to say, well, now we're starting to see sequential quarterly slowing. It, Azure's growing every month, but it's growing or every quarter, but it's growing a little slower than it did the previous. Now that could just be the law of large numbers. When Azure gets big enough and they don't report Azure numbers separately, it just gets harder to have a higher percentage growth. Uh, and Microsoft says the margins are better than ever thanks to multi-year contracts and multi-year contracts uh, lock in revenue, but they, they don't add to growth, right? Because that that's already right. in there. Um, also Windows revenue rose 7% on the year. We'll see how long that sticks around. A lot of it's strong OEM sales in advance of the end of Windows 7 support on January 14th. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll I mean, given they gave soon. away the operating system to most of the consumer base, like anytime they make money on Windows at this point is kind of fascinating. Well, they're making money off enterprise, a lot yeah. of money off enterprise, but they're also making it's, money off those OEM sales, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's free for you to upgrade your Windows, but it's not free for you to build a computer for sale to use right. Windows. So but that's yeah. what I mean though, for a while though, a, a huge potential source of revenue, they just ignored. And, you know, I, I'm also thinking, cause you know, we had like two years of, of, you know, uh, analysts telling us how the PC was dead and the PC was dead and the PC was dead. And it's like, oh, well, actually the tablet died except for, you know, fringes here and there. And the PC still seems to be going. <laughs> it's just kind of peculiar to watch. I actually think we're going to see the same thing with tablet, right? The PC right. didn't die. The PC reached its saturation point and then it kind of fluttered around until it found its new level. And that's kind of what we're seeing now. Uh, I have a feeling tablets are in the middle of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, uh, AMD Ryzen, GPUs, NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2060s. There's a lot of choices out there. Patrick's going to help us break it down because it, if, what you were saying, if you want to build like a video editing PC or a gaming machine right now, it's a good time. It's a great time. Um, it's uh, We've been talking about this a lot on this weekend, computer hardware Uh uh, Sebastian Peak, who uh, is my co-host on that show, he, he's the editor over at PC Perspective. And it's been kind of crazy because in the last couple of weeks, we've had AMD's Radeon 5700 and 5700 XT, uh, you know, basically get announced. The benchmarks are out. You probably can't buy one until the end of this month. Uh, and then, of course, NVIDIA has dropped the GeForce RTX 2060 and 2070 Super because super is better than just having a number. And of course, uh, the big announcement at 7.7.2019 7, was the Ryzen 3000 series processors, which are really awesome um, because they are reducing power consumption, delivering huge performance. And uh, I'm just kind of fascinated by watching uh, what, what, uh, what AMD has been doing over the last couple of years. Um, if you are building a, a video editing PC, a workstation, um, Man, it's really easy to look at the Ryzen 3000s and want those desperately. They're on the seven nanometer process. Uh, that's given them some performance. It's given them some, uh, you know, some lowered power consumption. The real, real sweet spot at the high end is the Ryzen 7 3700X, eight cores, 13 threads, $329. Uh, if you can actually find one, the Ryzen 9 3900X is uh, $499, is a 12 core, 24 thread processor. Um, processor which is a really weird way of saying that but i was looking at uh 
you know, the, the 3700 X is I think 33% or 34% faster than my 1800 X. The Ryzen 9 3900 on stuff like video rendering is going to be twice as fast as my 1800 X. Um, that is a huge jump in performance, mostly because of the huge number of cores they're, they're putting on that for the money. Um, for comparison, like a Core i9 900K Intel's flagship, uh, eight cores, about five hundred dollars, um, and there's some fairly inexpensive Ryzen five CPUs, which are also uh, six core, twelve thread parts. So if if you are, there's a whole range of prices for these. They're just a phenomenal value for the money in terms of doing anything that involves lots of cores. Intel still has a gaming lead uh over amd uh the ryzen processors but it the gap is much narrower than it used to be and it's not going to be as important if, if you're not you know playing at 1080p with 140 frames per second it may not make much of a difference to you um they released a new 570 chipset with the new ryzen 3000 processors there's been some issues uh getting that kind of up and running for overclocking and stuff they've done a whole bunch of firmware updates uh that's kind of similar to what happened when they launched ryzen there were some memory issues uh with the firmware but generally speaking uh it works great and oh by the way if you already own one of the earlier ryzen processors you will be able to drop uh these newer ryzen 3000 processors in there you're just not gonna get some of these super cool features uh which are mostly necessary for people who want to overclock um 2060 2070 super those are the new gpus from nvidia they're essentially replacing the 2060 and 2070 uh the 2060 super is basically a 2070 the 2070 super is delivering you like 2080 performance for 200 dollars less um this is where a lot of folks think rtx cards should have been uh priced at launch um and these are great prices until you realize that amd's dropped the 5700 and 5700 xt if you've been looking at a, a vega 56 or 64 card don't stop don't vega is dead um, to buy vega. all right yeah yeah just like <laughs> buy don't let the door hit you on the ass um the 5700 series card is going to be cheaper and faster um, a lot faster. Seven nanometer process is helping them out big time. Um, the performance on these two cards is between the 2060 Super and the 2070 Super. Uh, and like the 5700 XT is often faster than the 2060 Super at the same price. So right now, AMD, uh, the 5700 XT is looking like a really amazing card for the money. None of these AMD GPUs have ray tracing. I don't particularly care. Uh, I don't think ray tracing is going to be super obvious for most gamers, I don't know, for another year or so. I think it's still something that's slowly being folded into game development. Uh, the other big news that came out, uh, or the rumor that's floating, is that the Ryzen 7, which was announced at CES 2019, it's probably end of life. Uh, it's a great article on Tom's hardware. Um, you know, AMD gave this great response. It was like, you know, there's plenty of cards in the channel. They're not denying that it's end of life. They're not confirming that it's end of life. They're just saying there's a whole lot of unsold cards out there. We're just not making any more, but don't, yeah. we won't say that. <laughs> yeah, we didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> but when you look at gaming performance, this is where the majority of these cards are going for to gamers. That $399 5700 XT, same gaming performance as the Ryzen 7, but it costs three hundred dollars less. Um, the seven's really a, a professional card for for you know particular content creation needs. Uh, most people uh, don't really need that card, and I think that's why it's sort of vaporizing away. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, at this point, it's kind of amazing the deals. By the way, another side note: if you're thinking about buying an SSD, go ahead and buy one. The prices are as low as we've seen, and the rumors are that uh, SSD prices are going to go up in the none too distant future, uh, either because of uh, manufacturers working together to artificially raise prices, uh, or because there's actually going to be uh, an increase in demand and a lack of supply. But SSD prices probably aren't going any lower anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, too, because we're, we're, we're not sure what that Korea-Japan dispute is going to do uh, to prices, but spot prices on, I think, RAM are already starting to rise yeah. uh, a little bit. So I, 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 I can't imagine that that wouldn't affect some other markets as well. Um, it <laughs> yeah. is such a, such a weird situation. Remember, like, uh, just a year ago, we were talking about, like, oh, is the high price of video cards ever going to end with these miners? <laughs> and now video cards are like, oh, my gosh, they're they're within range. You can actually buy them. But hurry up and buy your SSDs and your RAM, yeah. folks, because that might be the next one to go up.
it's been a, a little odd to watch. Like, you know, the RTX 2060 and 2070 super cards are out, uh, or at least 2060s are easy to find. Those 5700s aren't going to be available till later this month. But yeah, definitely if you're thinking about RAM, if you're thinking about an SSD, just go ahead and upgrade that now. So it sounds like the the short version of this, sorry, Sarah, uh, is uh, get yourself a Ryzen CPU and then look at the NVIDIAs and the AMD 5700s. Yeah, it's really tempting. If you're going to spend three hundred fifty dollars for a, a you know a GPU, you probably don't need to unless you're you're gaming at a higher resolution than 1080p. But if you are looking at that and you aren't particularly obsessed with ray tracing, i.e. the RTX stuff from Nvidia, those 5700s are looking really sweet right now. Yeah, I guess my uh, before we move on, Patrick, my question is gaming. Well, I don't care so much personally, but I definitely do care about video editing. So. Uh, of of all of the the options that we ran through, if somebody mm -hmm. was going to, I don't know, build a rig from scratch, and I know in my case, the editing itself doesn't really bog me down too much, but the encoding does. <laughs> yeah, you know, like where 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 would you where would you point me? I would point you towards the uh, the fastest or the the most number of cores you can get on a Ryzen processor. When I went from my last Intel processor on my primary desktop to the eighteen hundred X, I my render speed, I want to say, was like 50% or 75% faster because I was throwing so many cores at it. Um, you know, if from my 1800X, which is a, a pretty fast processor, if I go to a 3700X, it's going to render video 33% faster. If I can, you know, if I can find a 3900X, they're really difficult to find right now. That's the $500 processor. I'm going to render twice as fast. And so depending on which processor you're running right now, it could be twice as fast. It could be, you know, two or three times as fast uh, as the processor you're, you're running now. So for me, that's like, you know, going from a 10 minute render to a five minute render. And that's huge. Also well, gamers and video <laughs> editors alike, thank you for participating in our subreddit. You know who you are. You can submit stories and vote on others. Any tech news story applies at uh, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. We also get those electronic mails, don't we? We do. <laughs> and in fact, we got one. It's funny that you mentioned it, Tom, from Alan from the cornfields of Southern Illinois. Hmm. So I don't Good know place. if he's your rival or he's well, I'm from the peer. soy fields. So, you know, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, so, he's pretty you know. cool. He's cool. All right, cool. Alan uh, Alan's in the is uh invited to the barbecue. Alan says, "I found it interesting that you have issues with a robot bartender, but not a robot car." As always, I love your tech show. Keeps me in the loop. Keep up the great work. <laughs> <laughs> and to Alan I say, Whoever said that we have no issues with robot cars? <laughs> That's all we do is talk about the issues with robot cars. Yeah, I I will say for myself, I probably expressed slightly more skepticism of the robot bartender <laughs> than the robot car, than the autonomous cars, uh, because I feel like so many people criticize the autonomous cars. Uh, right, but right. Yeah, we had a few people uh, write in about this uh, and kind of, you know, re-emphasizing Roger's point about like, yeah, this is this seems to be for restaurants and, uh, you know, right. and, and agreeing with the idea of like, if it's not a professional bartender who knows what they're doing, I'd actually rather the robot make it maybe. Uh, yeah, seems like it would just, I don't know, it would be more consistent, perhaps, you know, yeah. don't have to worry about if robots having a bad day, poor is going to be the same. <laughs> until you know we reach the point where robots take over and then it's a whole different story the idea of a robot bartender put you off patrick uh, you know i uh there's a whole <laughs> series of science fiction stories from the 40s about a a sort of blackout alcoholic inventor i found this massive 1944 book of uh, anthology of science fiction stories um so i'm laughing because a i turned out to be an alcoholic blackout drinker and b uh one of his great stories involved him inventing a a liquor organ where he would type in the recipe on a keyboard and the, the alcohol would fly out so i'm just always delighted when technology catches up to the science fiction i read when i was eight years old oh, and you know uh, you know, it, it's, I'm an alky, you know what I mean? Like if the robot's going to shut me down, it's just as big a pain in the ass as the human robot. And by the way, the robot's probably not going to spot me like a free drink on every third order. And it probably doesn't have a heavy thumb. So screw the robot overlord bartenders. Give we me could all, but I mean, we could also, we could apply this to, bartenders. you know, the, uh, the kale avocado smoothies, mm, true, right? True. You know, do what? 
I don't have That's to take the cool. robot for giving me time. the perfect smoothie. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, uh, to, to Patrick's point, uh, Len Peralta couldn't be with us today, but he did illustrate the show ahead of time uh, about this email. The art is titled Robo Car versus Robo Bartender <laughs> and is a robot in a car with the words, don't mix and drive. <laughs> Please. Nor, nor should you. Your robot bartender should not be operating the robot car. The robot car should have its own AI separately. I think that's important. Uh, and if you'd like to get uh, a copy of Lens Print, go to lenperaltastore.com. Or if you're a patron of Lens at patreon.com slash Len, you already have it. It's there in your Patreon. Go check it out. Patreon.com slash Len. Yeah, we miss you, Len Peralta, on the show today, but thank you for supplying your art. You are a genius, as always. Also a genius, Patrick Norton. Patrick Norton, where can oh, people keep you. up with the rest of your work? Uh, Twit.tv slash Twitch is This Week in Computer Hardware, and uh, avxl.com is a good place to go. Excellent. Thanks to everybody who supports us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash DTNS keeps us with the lights on. It would be very dark if you weren't supporting us at patreon.com slash DTNS. And we want to know what you think. Take our survey at dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep those emails coming. We love to read them. And you might make it on a future show. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday, folks. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>